Now, can you hear me now? Check one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Okay, so I'll just chop, I'll have to chop off the beginning of this video. I can do that in uh, YouTube. I can actually edit. I never, I never do. Occasionally I do. I did the one, there was one time where I, oh, I remember we were doing a live stream. It may have been early on in this or another, I think it was another live stream. And, uh, how's the guitar level? Everything pretty good? Um, the, uh, yeah, I actually, because I played a little bit of the song Always that I wrote on, and um, uh, and the YouTube said, you can't put that on there, and they said, but we can clip it out for you, and I said, okay, fine. It was like 30 seconds, if that, so there's like a 30-second jump in my video, <laughs> but uh, I don't know how many people even noticed. I think what happened was I had the OBS software already open. And then I opened the uh, lo open logic, and then that rerouted my microphone again. So that's what it's 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 one of those things where I have to do things in a certain order. It's not going to work. But I was having a hard time keeping my hard drive uh, from from ejecting itself. Um, I'm having trouble with my iMac. It keeps ejecting hard drives. In fact, I just emailed a friend of mine who's an expert on this kind of stuff, and. Uh, uh, buh, 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 buh. Firmware issue in the drives. Okay, send me model numbers and I can do some research. Okay. Um, I'm gonna text, I'm gonna email him right now. This is cool, thanks. Uh, live streaming now. <laughs> Great television here. <laughs> but I mean, how many times do you watch a watch a movie now and they're emailing or texting or, or on computers or Googling something and you're like, you're totally engaged. So this is very important. Actually, it had me cussing this morning. It's been happening more and more and I'm like, what is the deal? Uh, let's see now. Well, after. All right. <laughs> but my friend Scott is a very, is he's, it's funny because He's been into Macs before I even knew what a Mac was. Like, Scott was, he's, I, I never even saw a Mac before, and he was the first one. Oh, I touched my face, you guys, so we can take a drink. We got, we have a drinking game here. I'm glad I was able to get, without rebooting, um, without rebooting the, the uh, YouTube part of the stream. I was, so I was able to get it all working by rebooting just the OBS. So you guys had a pause, and I was frozen like buffering, and then it kicked back on, which is cool. So, um, live from L.A., it's Sunday morning. <laughs> exactly. Um, oh, the video's not very good? Dang it. I haven't changed anything. Um, I, hey, Dave, how's it going? Um, so I'm not sure what's happening. I, I thought maybe it was um, it was happening before we moved to the house. So I know it's not. I thought maybe it was a power issue because I think the power here is flickers every now and then. But I've got a power conditioner that has a battery. So my hard drives and my computer are plugged into that. Not everything like speakers aren't. So I wouldn't be able to um, keep working really. But it would 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 uh, prevent my hard drives and my computers from being. Um, just powered down uh, suddenly, which isn't a bad thing for a Mac. A Mac can kind of handle that. They've got built-in things, but hard drives, maybe not so much. So, um, oh, good. I'm glad the video is there. Good. I've been, wa I've watched a couple on uh, my phone and I'm like, wow, it l I think this looks better with this software, which is weird because in my head, <laughs> it's like, it's like making recordings. And every time you do another, you know, another, uh, pass or whatever you run that you know you do a copy of a copy of a copy the quality gets worse and worse and worse so in my head i'm thinking layers okay this is another layer it shouldn't be it should be worse but um it's it's better so um let's see what we see you can yeah you can 
Oh, and what do I have it set at? Um, hold on a second. Okay, I have so I have three possible settings I can put my the stream on at on the YouTube um, uh, stream settings, and it's normal normal latency, low latency, and ultra low latency. And I put it on low latency, so it's a little bit less quality, but it gives me a little faster response with some of the comments. Hey, Don Myers. Yes, all of the prior lessons are up there. Uh, someone said they couldn't go bef past or before lesson 37. If you go to, and I need to make sure, I can do this right now, but if you go to um, my playlist and look for the live stream playlist on my YouTube channel, um, and I can pull that up, but you know what? I'm wondering if I actually, the last couple I've actually put in playlists, because I haven't been, I've been so busy. Oh, it looks like I'm, Pretty caught up. Oh, you know, I don't know. Let me see. I, it's do, that's part of the problem. It's doing it automatically for me now, too. Uh, so, no, it's not in playlists. So, I'm going to put it in two playlists, the basics and the live streams. Um, and i got to save. Right. And, oh, and that's this one right now. That's funny. Okay. So, I just put this one in a playlist. <laughs> so, let me, let me put yesterday's in a playlist. Yeah, see, I didn't put it... The cool thing is, though, wh wh the way I'm doing it now, it's saving. Oh, wait. Where are all my playlists? Oh, that's weird. It's saving. Um, it's saving my all of the the content and stuff like that. So um, the uh, the description, it saves that. So that's the cool thing about it. Um, so I can I don't have to copy and paste that anymore, which is dope. Also, I uh, was telling you about a book a while ago that I was going to talk about. I remember I did that video on uh, teaching yourself how to read, right? Um, it was an actual released video. Um, here we go. That's easy. Um, and I, w I said I was going to do a more advanced version of that or going to the next level or whatever. Um, and so I, I'm going to I'm going to do that still. Uh, but I found I was kind of looking through something else, and I found. Uh, this book that I that really was a game changer for me in so many ways. Um, um, let's see. Oh, I think I'm getting invited to London. <laughs> like, heck yeah. I love that. Is, did I just see that text right? Who's in London? Anyone here in London? Uh Oh, <laughs> thumbs up. I, one of my composers just said he needs to go to London to do a recording. He wants me to come along with him. See, oh, Kathy, see your previous. Uh, let you go through. Sorry. Okay, no worry. Don't worry. No, Kathy, don't ever worry. Don't ever apologize, okay? <laughs> Don, thank you so much. Uh, the Tom Commandments continue to decrease in count. Yeah, we added yesterday, right? Um, anyway, this is pretty dope. I'm pretty stoked about this. Because um, we would be recording in Abbey Road Studio 2. <laughs> I mean, how cool is that? Oh, my gosh. I get to fly to London and play guitar at Abbey Road. So we just filmed me finding that out. <laughs> that's pretty cool. I'm sorry, but that's just like the coolest thing ever. Um, so let's see. The Yesterday Squad is here. Northern California, Don Myers. Awesome. Great to have you, man. Uh, I'll tell you what the be the thing the be the biggest benefit from this uh, live streaming the lesson series that I've been doing since this whole coronavirus thing started. And I started early on this, so I, we've the the best thing about this is the community that you just became part of, not this. This whole thing, this is is not worth anything. This over here, that's worth everything. You guys are the best. So uh, yeah, Kathy, don't worry about it, okay? Um, uh, and yeah, when Kathy you leave, just tell everybody to be on their best behavior, and we'll try to do that. 
So I, I want to review. I want to. I want to play the blues some more. Um, I uh, I I think we uh, um, today we're going to. So we're about fourteen minutes in, and um, I'm now getting to the lesson. <laughs> you got that, Kimberly? <laughs> so I want to review what we've done so far. Except we won't do the ultra simple blues. We're going to go ahead and do the more this what I call the simple blues. We won't do the simplest blues. So we'll start basically at day two. Um, we're going to review that. We're going to play it a few times. Again, if you can't change chords fast. Um, I'm changing guitars. That's one of the rules. If I change guitars, you can take a sip. <laughs> I'm going to check it. Okay, it's in, it's in, a, it's in standard tuning. Um, and uh, the, uh, if you can't change chords fast, then we're just, just play what we call footballs or whole notes, or also called diamonds. Those are all terms for um, uh, David. Jazz blues would probably have more, uh, like you said, 13th chords, 9th chords, things like that in it. Um, and also jazz blues might be more the approach. Um, uh, David asked the question, what's the difference between uh, jazz blues from the blues? Um, for example, if I were to play a more jazz blues thing, I might, um, a lot of it's attitude. I might use more uh, modes, you know, like for example, over E, I might use E mixolydian. And that would sound a little bit jazzier. And then over the A7, I would use A mixolydian. Or you might use some variation. Some, something like that over the A, you know, in B7 you would use B mixolydian. And you'll notice that I played all three mixolydian scales in the same position. Ultimately, that's what you want to be able to do. I, I even referenced this, I think, yesterday or the day before, where it just doesn't sound good to go. Here's the E chord, I'm playing the E blues. Oh, A chord? Okay, let's go up to A. Oh, back to E? Okay, let's go. Oh, B? Okay. It just sounds like you're moving a scale around which is the luxury of the guitar. It's one of the beauties of the guitar. Like I always say, and this is not a drinking game <laughs> rule, but I always say, you know, if you learn one chord or one scale and it has no open strings, it, you've learned 12, because it's completely movable. Okay, so that's the beauty of guitar, but we can also take advantage of it and use it against itself, against the better, the betterment of music ultimately. The goal in a lot of ways is to um, be able to play scales for every chord you're playing over in one position. And that way, well, there's many reasons for that. One way, you don't have to be necessarily looking at your hands. If you've got a lot of chords or a lot of things to look at on the music, uh, you can be concentrating on that and not worrying about looking at your hands because they're not moving around. Uh, but if I were to play A mixolydian, and then go to D mixolydian, and then to E mixolydian, I should be able to go from one to the other seamlessly without going like A mixolydian. If you have to do that, you're going to have to look down a lot. You're probably going to mess up because you're going to go. You're going to you're going to miss a fret or something like that. So, um, but but my point being that yeah, you're you're probably going to use more, you know, more diatonic scales in a in a, um, j a jazz blues context, and you're. I would say just in a, in the practice of it, you're going to be maybe less redundant in jazz blues. That's not denigrating to blues blues. It's just in blues blues, you're you're probably going to have lyrics, so you can kind of do. You can kind of the expectation of the listener in a blues blues context is is that you're going to try to say more with less. In the jazz blue context, you're going to try to say more with more. <laughs> <laughs> so if that makes sense. And, and that's just my personal opinion. I could have 10 guys come up here and totally disagree with everything I just said. So it's a really hard thing to, to delineate. Um, but again, we're going to... So, okay. So hopefully that... that uh, J Gary said, I played for my parents yesterday. I played the E7, A7, B7 progression. And my 86-year-old man goes, I like that. <laughs> You know, I would literally write a check for $10,000 right now if I could play for my parents again. Uh, that would be amazing. Um, who is Gary? 
<laughs> Bobber's asking who's Gary. Uh, that's cool, Gary. <laughs> Uh, Gary, Gary is my scribe. No, my, Gary is the, per, the, the, uh, not the scribe. Uh, AJ's the scribe. Uh, Gary is the, what would you call, what would you call yourself, Gary? What is your role in all this? Okay, Don is asking me a question. Hold on. Uh, did anyone catch the name of the book that Tom said he was a game changer? No, I haven't said it yet. Sorry. <laughs> Squirrel. <laughs> And I haven't had a chance to look this up. You might find it on eBay, but I don't know if... It is called Guitar Seeds. This thing I got when I was in high school, I thought. And it was in the music store. Um, the publisher... I mean, look at this. It's, it's, a, it's Jack Grassle. It's a typewriter book. Literally, Guitar Seeds. Pretty crazy. Um, Jack Grassle... It's Guitar Seeds Theory, Technique, Practice Manual for Growing Guitars. Um, I don't know who he is, but it is... This is where I learned all of my the Drop 2 stuff from, okay? And it gives you some real practical um, exercises. Uh, and, I mean, it's, it's intense, but um, it took me a long time. I never got through the whole book, ultimately, you know, I... I got what I needed to get out of it for the most part. There's also some sight reading exercises in it. Um, but look up, see if, see if anyone can find that. <laughs> I mean, this thing, look at the binding on it. It's like all broken and it's the old plastic thing. I mean, this is so brittle right now. I haven't had this thing out of the closet in years except to move from one apartment to the house. Um, but yeah, this thing is, this thing is pretty cool. And, and he does talk about that, you know, being able to go from one skill to the next right in midstream, um, which is a, a, a fairly advanced skill. I would call that a moderate to advanced skill. Um, keeper of the rules. Okay, so Gary is the keeper of the rules. Um, he's he's the, the tablets. You're the you're the what you know you're you gotta we gotta make some tablets. <laughs> you're gonna be the keeper of the tablets. So okay, now the lesson is starting at 21 minutes, Kimberly. <laughs> Let's assume it starts right now. Uh, but I'm going to get my foot rest out so I can keep my guitar a little higher here. I put it under my right foot like this so you guys can see better. Okay. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and play that uh, jam track. It's 80 beats per minute. We're going to be playing East. Um, let's see. We're going to be playing uh, this. Uh, e7. A7 and B7. If you're just joining, uh, e, uh, joining us, E7 is all six strings with uh, your second finger on the second fret of the fifth string and your first finger on the first fret of the third string. And that makes E7, okay? A7, you start on the fifth string, so try not to hit the bottom string. If you hit the bottom string, that note is actually technically in the chord, but it might just, it might make, not make it sound so much like an A7 chord. If you hit the A in the bass, it's going to sound more like an A7 chord. So uh, that would be open, and then second fret on the fourth string, open G string, second fret on the second string, and open E string. So I'm just using two fingers for that one as well. And you can see the fingerings there in the in the diagram. Um, those numbers reference the fingers on your left hand that you're using, not the frets. Okay. And then if you move those two fingers up one string each and add your first finger right there and add your pinky down here, that's B7. Easier said than done. Um, so again, you start from the fifth string. This is one you definitely probably don't want to hit the E string. That'll just make it really muddy and indiscernible as a chord. I'm lazy and I bring my thumb around here to deaden the E string. Uh, but if you're having trouble making notes ring out because bringing your thumb around tends to make your fingers lay down, you're going to probably have to just try to miss that string. One of the tricks you can do on your right hand um, in those situations, if you have to miss a string, is go ahead and aim for the top four strings. And if you happen to hit the fifth string every now and then, that's fine, okay? But you really don't want to hit all six strings because that's just going to be a little bit... Uh, uh, That's our B7. Okay, so if you can't change quick, then just hit downbeats. We're gonna be, the tempo is 80 beats per minute, so it's fairly slow. Two, three, and then change to A, and then to E, okay? 
But if you can play quarter notes, you can go for it. If you can, if you already got this down, you don't need to practice it. Then go ahead and solo. Practice using our uh, maybe uh, the E minor, E minor pentatonic, or if you want, if you remember the E minor blue or the E blues from yesterday, we're gonna go over that some more. Okay, um, and then um, uh, if you want to, um, uh, you can play higher up or whatever. Um, keep in mind that E minor blues can be moved. So you could play it 12, 12, 15, 12, 14, 12. If you're playing electric and you want to work on playing up higher, you can also play it up there, okay? Uh, but if you're not, if you haven't gotten to the point where you've played this progression all the way through a thousand times, not in a row, <laughs> but a thousand times perfect, okay? So if you accidentally do a 12 bar, or I mean a 13 bar blues or a 12 and a half bar blues or an 11 bar blues, it doesn't count, okay? You got to do it again. So that's really our goal is to try to get to the point where you've played this a thousand times and I'm going to logic. Here we go. Um, okay, so that's the tempo. One, two, E, four. A, now E. A seven. E seven. Okay, now we're getting to the bottom line. Here we go. E7, 2, 3, B7, D7, A7, sorry, E7, B7, E7, A7. Okay, David, after we do this a few times, we'll do a warm-up, okay? A7. Yeah, you wouldn't want to use E major over this. If you're going to do a diatonic scale over the E chord, you'd have to change over each chord, though. E would work over the B7, this chord here, though. Because B7 is the five chord in the key of E. Anybody find that book yet? I'm... Oh, there's a used version on Amazon. Nice. Oh, my audio is low. B7. You can do whole notes like this. Also called footballs or diamonds because they look like, when you write them, they look like a football or a diamond and two a7 so hit a7 on one and again on one three four two three e7 if you want to add your pinky here on the e7 you can do that too on the on the second string b7 to a7 this gives you a new e7 to play to b7 okay back to e7 hold up Two, and you can count these. These can average. I didn't keep track of how many we've done. We're almost at 10, I think. So you'll chip away at that thousand. And the reason, again, that you're doing the thousand is so that you can play this progression without messing up for friends. And they won't get frustrated trying to jam over it. And when you're soloing, you'll know what's coming up. Okay, that should be enough for now. We're gonna go back to it as we add the, um, so they're saying the level's a little low. My level's turned up all the way here, but I can go one more click up on this, or maybe I can go this way. Check, one, two, one, two, does that change? Hello, hello. Is that any louder? A little bit louder there, I think. Um, let's see if I, definitely quieter. So I can make it a little bit louder here. I just wanna be careful that I'm not peeking, and I have to remember <laughs> that I changed it. Because I use that for recording my acoustic. <laughs> so the other day I was like, I, I we had just done uh, the live stream and um, I uh, went to record some acoustics. I put my ears in. I wasn't I wasn't thinking, and I played the first chord. I was like, ah, and take my ears out. It was so loud. Um, also, just on a side note, 
just want to share some stuff with you. I, I, I'm keeping, you know, I'm, YouTube is really good about analytics, man. They just let you know. So I've got 74,494 current subscribers. Is that crazy? In the last 28 days, it's gone up 4,500 subscribers. So it says, uh, my views are up 81%. My watch time is up 96%. My revenue is up 134%. So all of that's encouraging. It's fun. It's cool. It's like in this time when work is maybe a little bit slower. Well, my wife is not working at all. So, you know, it, it's, it's pretty cool. When I click on analytics, I can see more information. Um, the, uh, who, who, so I can give you, know, like, give you an idea of my audience. Um, See, believe it or not, watch time is uh, watch time for is eighty three percent non subscribers, and that's because my number one video that is probably seventy five percent of my um, view count is the um, uh, se like seventy five percent of my view counts are from Seven Tips for Older Beginners, and so that's kind of an intro. Uh, to my channel. So many, so many people that subscribe to me, that's where they saw me first. So, but then a lot of people that watch that, um, don't, uh, subscribe. So, and that's fine. I mean, I, you know, if it's, if it, if I'm not resonating with you as a teacher, you know, I, I try to subscribe to pe teachers I like. So, uh, the age group thing is six, six <laughs> percent are 18 to 24, which is pretty cool. Um, 25 to 34 is 14%. 34 to 40 or 35 to 44 is 15%. 45 to 54 is 20%. And of course, my age graph uh, demographic, uh, 55 to 64 is 24%, which is the largest of the percentages, which makes more sense, which makes sense. Um, uh, and then 65 and plus is, is 20%. Um, and I can, um, yeah, overall, uh, it's 10% female, which is the ladies like me. <laughs> but part of the reason why, um, uh, you know, YouTube is a more of a um, male dominated platform for to some degree. Um, and it's changed. I think that's changing a lot. Um, but like Pinterest and Tumblr was largely women used those platforms more than than YouTube. Um a lot of gamers and stuff on YouTube. So, uh, but also the guitar. Yeah, right. Don't tell Beth. The a lot of the, um, uh, you know, and, and, and guitar players. You know, if you just, you know, professionally watch watching bands, most of them are guys. So that makes also sense. So my subject matter is also more uh, likely to be. And, and historically, I probably had probably ten percent of my students were were female. So. Um, Oh, nice. Okay, that's the ISBN for the Guitar Seeds book. That's crazy that it can't still be a publication, though. What was, did somebody say they found, they found it on, um, yeah, the book is uh, Jack Russell Guitar Seeds. And it's a pretty advanced book. So if you're, you know, if you're thinking about getting it, it, it you know, it, it's pretty, it's like if you really want to get into jazz guitar and stuff like that, that's pretty much... It's it the the byline here is theory techniques and practice manual for the growing guitarist. Um, it gets it's and there's no tab in it, none, zero. You can see it's all music, okay. Um, and these are these are just random exercises more than anything. It's not real music. It's it's mostly like what if the chord changes? To, it's it's the idea is, and I've seen this done by a lot of jazz guitarists is basically. How do you prepare yourself for every possible jazz chord combination? Because if you look at if you look at the um, lexicon of uh, jazz standards, you know if you're going to solo because basically the way you play a jazz standard, um, I don't have a copy of the real book here, but you play the song we call it playing the head, play the song down once, and then you know somebody whether it's a sax player, whether it's the I'm going to touch my face because I'm thirsty. Um, Um, whether um, uh, it's a sax player, whether it's a guitar player, a piano player, whoever, trumpet player, whoever's playing the melody, you play it down once, and then and then you play the song down exactly the same form, you know, and you play it 
for everybody to take solos potentially. It doesn't have to be everybody. You maybe don't want a drum solo and bass solo in every song you play in a night. Uh, but if there's a sax player, he's going to take a solo. If there's a piano player, he's going to take a solo. If there's a guitar player, probably he's going to take a solo. And then, so ultimately, you could play the song down five or six or seven times. And then you play the head again, which means play the melody all the way to the end. And then you do some kind of tag. And some of the songs have very, very predictable tags. Sometimes bass players or keyboard players will set it up and they'll go, okay, t tag it or whatever. The sax player could set it up. You know, when you play it enough and you played it in enough real book gigs, and I've done a lot of those, um, you kind of know what tags are standard for certain songs, like Autumn Leaves and things like that. Um, and then, um, uh, so that's basically, you know, the great thing about a real book gig is that you can show up with four musicians that you've never played with before, and you can all play, and people will come up and say, wow, you're great, how long have you guys been abandoned? And you can look at your watch and go, uh, since 7.30, because <laughs> that's pretty much true. Um, so Kathy is saying, uh, we'll take two sips when my mocha is ready. Okay, catch up, Kathy. Um, Twitch, yeah. Twitch is, a, yeah, Twitch is definitely a male-dominated uh, platform. But then again, I've, I've seen, you know, a lot of female gamers. And I follow a couple, um, <laughs> you can tell when I'm going to say something, don't you, can't you? Uh, I, I follow a couple of uh, playlists, I guess you could call them, or whatever, on Twitch. One is singer songwriters, or singers, you know, musicians. And then the other one is uh, any play, anybody playing Apex Legend. Because I played all the guitars on Apex Legend. In fact, it's that composer that just texted me and asked, told me I'm going to London next year. So, um, Anyway, <laughs> so everybody take another sip. That's one of the rules of the game. If I say I played all the guitars on Apex Legend, if I proclaim my involvement in <laughs> Apex Legend, then, uh, and just having the word legend in there, Gary, sounds, sounds right, doesn't it? Okay, so, um, and I for, okay, so now we, we did uh, that, and then I can do that down button, and here's the E minor pentatonic. Let's review this. Let me make it a little smaller, just in case I happen to angle my guitar up. Or, you know, even better, I'm just going to put it right there. That's, I don't have to worry about my guitar at all. Now I can make it bigger. There we go. <laughs> so if you're just joining us... <laughs> I'm the un... See, you didn't see me touch my face, did you? I didn't... How do you know I touched my face? You have no idea if I touched my face. I could pick my nose right now. You would have no idea. I'm the unknown guitar teacher. <laughs> That's a reference. Okay. Um, okay, which real book is the one for jazz? Let me see if I can find that one before we're, we're, we're done, uh, uh, David, and I'll post a link. Uh, because there are a bunch of them, and they're ones that call themselves... No, you want... There's a specific one you want. <laughs> Sorry. This is annoying. <laughs> there's a specific one that you want. Um, stealth mode. <laughs> exactly, Bruce. <laughs> oh, <laughs> chord head. That's a scale head. That's actually a better name. I had a band in high school called Scalehead. <laughs> it's like half man, half fish. Um, so I, uh, um, yeah, I'll post the right one. There's, you want the one that's in C. You don't want the B flat one. That's uh, because you're not a trumpet or a, an alto sax or tenor sax. Alto would be the E flat one. Soprano sax would be the B flat one. And baritone sax would be the E flat one. Um, and so, uh, you want the C one and you also want, you want the, you know, they do have multiple versions. I actually have, what I did was I made copies of a friend's version. He had some songs in it that I didn't have. And then I put it all in a big notebook. Um, so he, I had some that he didn't have and he had some, it's weird because originally it was done. It's, it's the, the real book is making fun of the term fake book because everybody brought fake books to gigs, but the real book was a kind of a way of, uh, it's, it's, uh, of having one, everybody have the same one, so you could just call out songs and everybody would have it. So I'll I'll uh, I'll try to find that in just a little bit, and then I'll post it. And it's big, um, and I think they go for maybe thirty or forty or fifty bucks. It's a, it's a lot of songs. It could be five hundred songs in there, or whatever. And there's some really tough ones that might, you know might have Spain from um, from Chick Corea, but then they'll have you know, like.
all the things you are, those kind of standards, um, which are all ones you should know if you're going to be a jazz musician. Um, and, um, and then they also have lyric versions. So many of these songs have lyrics, and so many of these songs have had lyrics written to them. Uh, but you don't want that one. You, you definitely want the, the one that's standard for musicians. So I'll post it in a second. Uh, the, I've seen the guitar grimoire. I think uh, grimoire, I'm not sure how you say it. Grimoire. <laughs> our, our, uh, Dennis, what did Dennis, oh, the dark, yeah, the dark guitar teacher. I'm going to put that there. Okay, let's do this scale together. Okay, you ready? Open E. Bottom string open. Third fret. Open A. Second fret, open D, second fret, open G, second fret, open B, second fret, open E, second fret. Is Bob here? Bob's here. Hey, Bob. I'm cleaning the garage too. This is actually just my surrogate. Someone in a butler shirt. That could or could not, may or may not be me. Here we go. Okay, you got it? You got it? You got it? Okay, do it again. Now we're gonna memorize it, ready? One, two, three, four. That's the goal is to memorize some of these things I've seen for, so I gotta move this back over here. All right, so uh, there it is in the context of the, uh, or there it is, and there is the blues, the simple blues. Um, and again, I, I've said this before, you can practice the scale, um, but maybe not, don't practice the scale with the blues, over the blues. Okay, when you're playing over the blues, you can take it simpler, okay? If you look, if you look at those three notes here, I wish I could point and show <laughs> But these three notes right here, okay? Right there, we did this yesterday, or day before, I can't remember. Um, you've got an E, you've got an A, and you've got a B, okay? Um, and so we can, with that, play the third of each of, I mean, the root of each of these chords. We've got the E. So when it's an E chord playing, you play the E. When there's an A chord playing, you play the A, E, and then A again, and then E, and then B, A, E, B. And so what I'm gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna do this again. Um, we did it yesterday or the day before. I'm gonna hit the track 80 beats per minute. Um, a G major scale, that C note's just not going to work over anything. I mean, it might kind of work over the A7 because it's the it's the the minor third. Um, uh, but a, a G scale, this is a G major pentatonic, but a G major scale would not work. Okay, um, and we can add some notes to this, but they're going to be notes that you're going to at times. I'm going to. My, this is my this is my face <laughs> when I'm thinking. Am I going to go to that next lesson? Because I have something here for you that I prepared this morning, but I just didn't know if I was gonna show it tomorrow or today. Ah, but don't look, okay, <laughs> see? You didn't see that. Um, and so what, what I, what I wanna show you is how you can make minor changes in the pentatonic scale to accommodate the different chords and to make them sit a little bit better in the chords because yeah, I, I'll admit that the E minor pentatonic is not perfect over the A7 chord. It definitely doesn't work great over the B7 chord, but it, it works good it works great over the E7 chord and pretty good over the A7 chord, um, but we we need to make some changes if it's gonna if it's gonna work. And so that's why almost one of the reasons why I think blues is kind of one of those less is more proposition uh, because you can't just jam a, so, a a scale like if I'm playing in uh, if I'm playing like two five one in the key of A. I mean key, key of C. You know if I'm doing. Uh, 
I see you. If I'm doing that, I can play C scale all day long and it's gonna work. You might have some notes that are like, eh, that doesn't sound so good over that chord, but you can always, I, and this is a, a, a little secret, a little trick, uh, inside scoop, pro guitar secret here. If a note's not working over a chord, uh, go down or up one diatonic tone and that note will work probably. I mean, almost that is almost 100% foolproof. In other words, let's say for example, over the C chord, I play an F, because C is in the key of F, but over the C major seven chord, that F doesn't sound very good. But if I go down a, a tone to E, that works. If I go up a tone to G, that one works. Both of those worked. F is fine over the C major seven if you're going somewhere. It works totally fine over that chord. Um, but if you're gonna sit on it, then it's a problem. So if, you're, if you find yourself on a note that's not working, you can always go up or down uh, a step. And that's a pro secret right there, boom. Um, but in the key of E, we've got three different major key, keys represented. Remember I told you this, E7 is only in one key, that's A major. So technically, if you wanna think of what major scale would work over this, you would sit, play an A major scale. The only problem with thinking A major is that you're thinking A root and you keep landing on A's over the E7 chord and it just, it just doesn't sound very good. Um, so you really want to resist the temptation to play in the relative major of all these dominant chords because all these chords, <laughs> still don't have to know how to do this. I got to practice this. <laughs> all of these chords right here are all dominant, the dominant, they're all the five chords in relative major keys. We talked about that. We talked about the one, two, three chord, four chord. So you should know a little bit about that. And those would be lessons on chord uh, chord theory, which I think we started, uh, I can't even remember now. It's been a while, probably in the 20s. Somewhere. <laughs> We've been doing this for a long time. Uh, David's nailing it right here. David says E7 is the five of A, A7 is the five of D, and B7 is the five of E. Meaning that those major scales, A would be the major scale that, could feasibly work over E7. Um, the key of a D major scale would work over the A7, and um, an E major scale would work over the B7. So if you're playing E major scale, thinking I'm in the key, of, I'm playing blues and E. The only time it would really kind of fit would be over the B7. But again, you're sitting there thinking of E's, and in my opinion, that E is that E rubs the B the wrong way. So why think in the key of E? That's why we use the fifth scale, which if you remember your scales, we studied modes and that was, I think week 13 is when we started modes. We had the major and then the second was the Dorian, then we had Phrygian, then we had Lydian, then we had Mixolydian. So the, the scale that works best over the five chord, and these are all five chords, dang it. <laughs> I can't do this. <laughs> these are all five chords, I'm an idiot. I don't know what's wrong with me, but these are all five chords. And so <laughs> I have to remember, I just do a duck, you know, a goose, and I can create. Uh, those are all five chords, and uh, they will uh, sound best if you use the Mixolydian scale for each of those. And that would be if you're going more of a... a, a so let me, let me show you what that sounds like, okay? Let me play the jazz. And, uh, and if you want to get some of your... Uh, I'm going to hit the, the track... If you want to get some of you play along rhythm wise, or if you just want to listen, that's fine too. I may not play in first position. I may move up and down a little bit, but um, I'm just going to play the mixolydian scale over each chord. So over the E chord, I'm going to play E mixolydian. A, I'm going to play A mixolydian. And over the B7 chord, I'm going to play the B mixolydian. Um, and you might say that sounds more jazzy. Uh, yeah, there, but there's other ways to play more jazzy over the blues too. And jazz blues would often have more turnarounds and more things. You know, that you might go like over the B. You might go. You might have a, a two five one, a lot more two five ones, and that would be more of a jazz blues too. When we're talking about, that's we're talking about the chord progression. I can make it a, a much jazzier blues progression. Um, when David was asking me, what's the difference between jazz blues and blues blues? Um, so it can be the approach you solo over it, but it can also be the chords you play as the foundation. But this one here is a very basic blues blues. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to play hit play. And if you want to strum along so you can get some of your thousand out of the way, let's do that. But otherwise, just um, you can just sit back and listen for a little bit. And I'll explain what I'm doing as I'm going. So I'm over E. 
Now I'm in A, mixolydian. So what I'm trying to do a lot is I'm trying to point out the differences between the two scales or the three scales. I'm really kind of trying to make sure that when I get to that change, remember I talk about that moment, that moment of change. Sorry, I just got to reorganize my window so I can see what I'm doing. Um, uh, I'm a little out of tune. I never understand why guitars go sharp. I understand why they would go flat, like the strings are stretching out or I'm bending or whatever. But it's like, they go sharp, that doesn't make any sense to me. I'm sure there's some physics behind it. Anyway, so like for example, when I was on the, um, okay, no quiz on this, take a sip. That's a new rule, that's the newest rule. If I say there's got, gonna be a quiz on this at the end of the week, uh, you can take a sip, okay? So I don't want you to stress about this, but it's funny because as I talk about it, and again, I, I really love trying to in, inject a little bit of music theory. In this, in this case, I'm injecting a lot of music theory. <laughs> so you're gonna gain some weight from the music theory on this one. <laughs> we're, 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 we're Botoxing music theory right now. So, but if I were to play like, for example, um, the E7 chord, I'm playing, G, say, E, mix, uh, e mixolydian scale. <laughs> You know, I've got the E, the F sharp, the G sharp. It starts out like an E major scale, but it's that the seventh tone is where you get, you can tell it's not a major scale. Major scale would sound like this. A do, uh, mixolydian sounds like this. So it's got that flat seventh in it. Okay. Um, so it's also got a G sharp, which is not in the A mixolydian. What is in the A mixolydian, the only difference between A mixolydian and E mixolydian is it has a G natural. So you'll notice when I went, that's when the A chord came up, I, I got rid of the G sharp and went to G for several reasons. One, I, I had to change to A mixolydian, but also I could have just gone to, I could have just gone to A, um, but that wouldn't have highlighted the fact that I know that I, I can I, I'm supposed to change the A mixolydian. When I go to the G, I'm definitely telegraphing that I know when I'm you know that I know that I've changed changed keys. Um, so that's kind of part of the reason why I was doing. It. I was trying to be real obvious about the key change. Um, I could sit here and go. I could have just played e, A the whole time, but A is in the E mixolydian and it's also in the A mixolydian, so it doesn't highlight that change. And then the same thing happens like when I go to that flat seven that's, that makes it mixolydian in E. Actually in, D, in B mixolydian, there's a D sharp. So now you do want to play the major. Remember I said the relative, David said the relative major of, I'll check out that in a second, Leo. Uh, the relative major of, of the, for, for the B7 chord was E major. So if I sharp that D, now I am in E major. So if I do something like, 
Now I'm highlighting the fact that I know that it went from A E7 e to B7. In the case of uh, the open pentatonic scale right there, it's the open D string and then you go to the first fret and you're, that's a note that's in this B7 chord. You can actually see that, okay? So Leo is asking a question, solo around E mixolydian or A mixolydian. Yeah, and then I went to, um, so E mixolydian, you know, go to B mix and then back to A mix. And that's the one that's a little harder to sell as the the B to the A moment because I mean at least they're only a whole step away so it doesn't sound like you're traveling halfway down the neck just to play a lick. Um, and eventually you start <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, but eventually you start to you can start to hear the change, and I, I'm really when I'm making playing that I'm really trying to highlight the notes that change, not just the roots or something. So anyway, that's so Leo. I don't know if that helps, but yeah, I'm going E mixolydian to A mixolydian and back to E mixolydian, and then when it goes to A, I go to the A mixolydian, so on and so forth. Um, and you might say that that's a jazzier way to play over those. Um, it definitely sounded jazzier to me than than doing you know. Okay, now, um, one of the, let's see, one of the things that I talked about, was it this? Yeah, so and we got the E blues here. I think in C5, I thought I had another. Huh, I guess when I pulled it off the side, it disappeared. <laughs> but you can see that the, the chords there, uh, the E7, A7, B7, and the notes in the chords. Okay, right, oh, dang it, right here. Hey, I'll do it this way. Boy, that just feels so weird. I don't know why I'm having trouble with this. It's messing with my mind. But this this little <laughs> image here is uh, giving you the harmonies in uh, you know the harmonies being the notes in the chords um, for the E, e um, the E A and B chords. And you can see if you look at the E minor pentatonic that there is some commonality. Like the E seven, three of the notes in the E seven chord are in the E minor pentatonic. Three of the notes in the A7 chord are in the uh, E minor pentatonic, and only two of the notes in the B7 chord are in the E minor pentatonic. Um, and so uh, you can see where the B7, okay, we may need a little bit of, um, uh, a little bit of, you know, help to, to kind of sell that B7 chord. Okay, so let me see. Uh, okay, from Leo, um, technically we could, B in the key of D and oof, it's the key of uh, O2 O two to a B secondary dominant <laughs> to Peter. I dare you to say that. <laughs> yeah, what oh, what did Bruce, what did Bruce say, Peter? I missed that. Peter, lots of practice. Uh, let's see. Oh, Rick, yeah, sorry. Yeah, and, and, and that's definitely, uh, Rick M, I think it was, yeah. Um, you can co totally go back and watch again. That's awesome. I, you know, it's, it's part of the beauty of, of having a video. Um, one of the goals is ultimately to be able to play, like I said, it's kind of the, like so many jazz players, they really want to be able to be prepared for any, possible chord progression coming at them and they want to have a hundred ways or hundred ideas of ways to play through it. Um, but ultimately, you know, you really do want to kind of be able to play a E, e a mixolydian any, in any position. We talked about that kind of with the cage method. That was the very first lesson we did, lesson number one. We did it for 12 days. We talked about the cage method. So I kind of gave an overview of not only using the cage method to find um, chords up and down the neck and, and increase your chord knowledge and be able to play more rhythm stuff up and down the neck, but also to increase uh, your understanding of, you know, where the scales fall. And so, um, like, I could play E mixolydian any, in any position if I... Um, uh, 
Um, and sometimes I might think in my head, you know, oh, I touched my face. Um, cheers. Sometimes I might think in my head that I'm playing an A if I'm, if, you know, it might make it easier for me to find E mixolydian if I think A major. Um, but you really, if you're playing over an E7 chord, you don't want to be thinking A major because you'll you'll land, you know, if you're playing in a in A, you're gonna think I'm gonna land on some A's there, but A's don't work. You know, it's just, it doesn't work over that. So. Um, <laughs> Hook killed two birds with one stone there. He says, I just wish I had eight hours a day to rewatch these streams. Oh, and sip. <laughs> it's the way you didn't have to hit return twice. That saved you a millisecond. Uh, Rewatching them a few times and practicing between after this is all done will definitely help. Yeah, and I'm, you know, every time you watch, I get credit for that. So, uh, you know, it's crazy. Um, Rick said, one thing I learned from my piano teacher, when you try something new and get frustrated, always end your session with something you play and yeah, uh, something you can do. Yeah. It's not, that's a great idea. That's a great tip. Uh, cause the goal is to stay, stay motivated. And I've said this a thousand, thousand times, probably. I, I wish I had a thousand lifetimes because I would do one lifetime where I would just do finger style guitar and another lifetime where I would just do, um, uh, would just do uh, blues guitar and another lifetime I would just play jazz guitar. Another lifetime I would just do rock guitar. Um, I'm kind of a jack of all master of none. Um, and I did that intentionally because, um, there, I've always, there's two types of guitar players that tend to work. The ones that concentrated a lot on one style and are the, in the, among the best at that one style, or those that can kind of play in a lot of styles, um, and can kind of cover a lot of bases and keep their dance card full, so to speak. Um, and so I'm falling into that latter category. Um, but the ones that get one thing down tend to be the famous ones, the ones we all know and hear. The ones that fall in the second one are the guys that just show up at work every day, maybe playing a pit band at a musical um, where they have to actually literally play classical guitar, acoustic, you know, steel string guitar, electric guitar, and maybe even bass in the same musical and may have to play five different styles in the same musical. Um, and, and, then the, and then they go and the next day they're teaching guitar lessons to kids that want to learn heavy metal and jazz, somebody wants to learn jazz, and somebody wants to learn classical, and then they have a real book gig later that night, and, and you know, it's, it's those guys you don't know about, but they're making a living too because they, they spread around their abilities. And um, so Ben's got a, oh, Pepper's got a question. Question, can you show some strumming patterns? Uh, yeah, I think we'll probably do that after we're done with the blues. We'll, we'll work on some strumming things. Um, the, uh, let's see, uh, I agree, Rick, my, Kathy says, my husband taught me never to leave a project when I'm frustrated with it. Just don't reach that point. Leave it while you're still excited about it. Yeah. And th yeah, that's what I do. So I was excited about being married to Beth and then I left her. <laughs> Second week of marriage. No, I didn't do that. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, Pepper, I, I mean, in the, in the process of looking for things to, um, to, to do as we continue these lessons, um, that definitely strumming is on the radar for that. Um, how many times has he said thousand today? Yeah, right? Well, you have to practice the chords thousand times, the, the, the blues progression. Um, let's see, do you remember, oh, okay. Do you recommend uh, buying a looper pedal? You can, I, I'm, I'm not very good at looper pedals um, I, 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 because, <laughs> And it's hard when, when you got 12 bars, you got to really make sure that you don't mess up on that last downbeat because it, it, I'm always early or late. So it ends up not being a perfect eight bars or 12 bars or whatever. Um, so uh, you, but yeah, you can use a looper pedal. I have the, this one, what is it? Um, where is it? Oh yeah, I have this one. And I got this to do uh, multiple loops and things like that. This one's a little bit more pricey. They make a, a mini one of this. I think it's $99 or something. Um, I, can, I can put a link to that. Um, also, I need to try to find that real book. Let me see. Um, but yeah, loopers are, are great. There's a, a lot of different ones. Uh, TC, I think they have a mini looper. Yeah, ditto looper. How much is that thing? 118, that's not bad. Um, 
the one the one I just showed you. Now there's a package with cables and everything was two fifty nine. Uh, they make a mid size one. The reason I have mine is I can I can do effects with it. I can put it in reverse and things like that. So it's more of an effecty kind of pedal. Um, let's see, I find the best reviews. And it, the, the the ditto is a little weird. Uh, it takes a minute to kind of get used to the you know, like you you hold down the button and it's only got one button and one knob. So um, it's really uh, if you want to take a look at it, here's the ditto looper. Um, you could also look at it at Sweetwater. You would see some uh, videos and things like that. You can look up videos on YouTube for that too. Also, uh, I want to find David the real book. Let's see. Oh, they have, well, they have a Kindle version for 16 bu 17 bucks. That's not bad. Uh, B-flat. No, we do not want the B-flat or the bass clef one. C instrument. Uh, book one of six, the real book. Oh, that's, like I said, that's the real pop book. They also have the pop book, and they have a Beatles real book, too. Um, the C real book. See, it's tough, because they all kind of use, I think this is it. If this has got 800 reviews, 4.5 stars. So this is probably it. How many pages does it say it is? 462 pages. That sounds about right. In fact, I think I can look inside and see the plate. The, uh, the... Oh, yeah. yeah. Night Train, Nefertiti. Yeah. Um, Nostalgia in Times Square. Yeah, this is Olio. Yeah, these are definitely the tracks. You One Note Samba, Ornithology, um, Out of Nowhere... Milano, Midnight Mood, Michelle, which is a Beatles song. Lady, Bur uh, Lady Sings the Blues is in here. Limehouse Blues. Uh, Lullaby of Birdland. Yeah, this is a good one. In fact, this looks, I think it's got even more in the mood. Um, so let me let me get a... Now this one is only paper... Oh, paper bag. Oh, dang. 65 bucks. So this one... Okay, so they only have used ones out there. Interesting. The Kindle version. I don't know. You could totally use Kindle version on. Well, and you can find them. On, uh, let me just give you the link, and then you can use this to try to find uh, another. You know, one, uh, I think in my video I did about the real book. I think I posted better links, but you can check that out. Okay, um, it's okay for questions. Feel free to put one stop sign at the beginning of your question for Tom. Yeah, that helps. Um, Yeah, it seems like I see the stop signs. If everybody uses it, though, <laughs> I'll probably stop seeing them, <laughs> right? Uh, let's see. Yeah, you have the Pod HD 300, which has built-in three-button looper. My, my Lexicon rig has a looper and has had it for with the, since the 90s. I've had this thing since the 90s. So um, Pepper is asking, how are you doing your fills to the music? How are you doing your fills to the music? Uh, I'm not sure I understand that question, Pepper. Um, you mean, because when I say fills, I mean licks, riffs, things like that. <laughs> Bruce 50 are watching this Tom Shops. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like great cinema, isn't it? Oh my gosh. Uh, so Pepper, I'm not sure what you mean by fills. Could you clarify that a little bit? Um, and so what were licks? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's just all, um, it's funny because we talked about this yesterday. Um, let's do, let's do this again where we, um, we play, um, uh, the root notes of each of these chords as they go by. And then what, what we can do is little variations on them. Licks, I, I try not to memorize licks and then play licks because I always feel like, oh, here's the spot I got to use this lick. And then you get nervous or you get excited and you start rush it or whatever the ultimate goal as i said before is to just have a conversation with your audience ultimate goal is to is to play music is to take the song to the next place uh to continue the story whatever that is and that story can be a very simple can be a very simple story um it doesn't need to be you know a a, a diatribe diatribe on you know some theological <laughs> reading of some, you know, C.S. Lewis book or Tolkien or something, you know, it doesn't have to be Tolkien. It, it can be C-Spot Run. Uh, so the, um, 
but what what you can do, but the licks. Um, Um, they, they start to flow out of the scale as you get familiar with the scale and as you start to use it. So watch this. For example, um, over the E chord, I'm, I want you to play this E right here on the fourth string, third, second fret. Over the A, we're going to play the, the, the uh, second, second fret of the third string, which is A. And over the B, we'll play second fret of the, of the A string, which is B. Okay, so those are our three notes. Now, all, in, in all three of those, this, this is the root. The seventh is open string. So the E note, that's E, okay? But if I hit the open D string, well, you'll see right there. <laughs> Gosh darn it. I cannot do this. Right there. Yeah, there we go. Right there, you can see uh, the, that the seventh of the D, or the E chord is D, which is our open string. If you look at the A, the seventh of the... Um, a note, uh, A chord is G, which is the open G string. And if you look at the B, the seventh of the B chord is A. Now, you don't need to necessarily be thinking, okay, now I'm playing the root, now I'm gonna play the seventh. No, it's just like, oh, now that you know that, we can play over the E, over the A, over the E, over the B. So check it out, all those would work. And those are licks. I would call those licks. Go chromatic. Watch this. Let's go to the B first. So watch this. I go chromatic to B. That's a little too much time on the passing tone. So if I go it's like this, it's better. Get a passing. Okay. The other thing we can do is we, here is the root. Here's the fifth. So we can go fifth, seventh root. on the B, we can go to the F sharp here. Okay, so that B, that F sharp that I went to is not in the key of, is not in the, in that pentatonic scale. But all those other notes are, sorry, let me get my screens reorganized. Okay, I got another stop sign from Pepper. Or stop sound from Kathy for Pepper. Uh, okay, so the root of each chord, can the other chord, uh, can the other chord notes be used? Uh, yeah, pretty much all of those, um, uh, all of those. So the the um, the uh, E works over the A chord because there's an E in the A chord. Uh, the A works, the e, A note works good over the B. I'm just trying to get you to change, just find that root for each of these chords. So the idea is to, is to kind of get a, a very small seed, a mustard seed of a, of a lick. And a lick can be one note or a fill or a riff, lots of words for the same thing. Um, and, and have them appear, make sure you play the root on when the chords change. Okay, over here, boop, boop, up there. Okay, because when uh, that just locks in even more your your understanding of what's coming next. Okay, uh, one five seven. Yes, um, and then the, in the case of like the G, so the one, so the other notes, yeah, can totally be used. I'm just trying to keep it simple right now, Pepper. So for example, you're saying, can I use the E and the B and the D? You can use all of them. Like if I can. 
let me just use, in fact, I've got the over here. Oh gosh. Over here. <laughs> over here. There it is. Over here is the E blue scale. Um, so let's see. Uh, yeah, you could probably get loopers on iPads. You, you know, they're probably free loopers all over the place. You don't need to spend a hundred bucks on a looper. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. So again, this, I'll just play in the pentatonic. So I'm actually doing the blue scale that's right over there. I can even play like chords. I'm just playing the chords right now. Even use the chords to solo. They do that a lot in blue gla uh, bluegrass playing. Uh, they'll solo around the chords, really using the shapes. Okay. Um, yeah, arpeggiating kind of. Yeah, you could totally do that, like over the. Mm. So I'm just playing the E chord, E7 chord, but I'm playing the fourth string, third string, and second string. Good. Exactly. So you can you can even play like that if you want. I mean, there's, you know, if you've got to take if you're in a band, you got to take eight choruses. <laughs> you're going to need as many as many tools as possible. Um, and so that's kind of kind of what you know what we're trying to do here. Um, so yeah, the licks start coming, and, and the the licks will start coming too. What what you want to do is you want to listen to blues, and if somebody does something, the hard the hard part about it, okay. I probably should do a lesson on this, and I, I'm not even exactly sure how to teach this. Uh, but like I said, that's a pretty standard blues progression. Um, the hard part is like, well, you you heard a lick that somebody did, but it wasn't the song wasn't in the key of E. So what we could do is we could compile a, that would actually be a really great thing to do is compile a, um, I'm going to touch my face again, take a sip. Um, that would be to compile a, uh, a uh, Spotify playlist or whatever of blues in the key of E and blues in the key of G and blues in the key of B flat and blues. So you, so you could have them all in the same key. And that way, if you're learning licks in them, you can go, okay, if I'm playing in E, I can use this lick. Because a lot of times, if, a, if, a, if the blues is in E, there's going to be a lot of open strings involved. But if it's in B flat, it's not going to happen. <laughs> but, you know, if you're listening to B flat and, and you hear someone go... You know, if you know what key you're in, then you can figure, you know, and you figure out the lick... Then it's a matter of going, okay, well, that's the root of B flat, and that's the flat three. So if I wanted to hit the root. Then you could transpose it. That's the thing, is you want to be able to get that lick down and, and play it in every key. So that's that's the hard part. One of the things is hard, it's really hard to teach someone how to figure out what key a song is in. 
But usually it's the first chord of the song and the last chord of the song. So if you listen to the first chord, that's probably the root of the, that's probably the key, and especially in blues. And if you listen to the, what, what chord does the song want to end on? Like our E blues, you know, whatever. If it wants to end on an E chord, then you're in the key of E. Okay, Kathy, God bless you. Thank you so much for helping out. I appreciate it. If uh, uh, Pepper, if you want to, if somebody uh, puts up a question and I don't see it, you might want to put a stop sign up, okay? Appreciate all you do. And I didn't, Pepper, uh, Kathy, I didn't see our friend on here today, so that's not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> so, Yeah, everybody be on your best behavior. We're almost done. I'm not going to go to the next thing. To, I'm going to do that. I'm going to save that for tomorrow. Uh, so that'll and we'll be talking more, even more in the licks. And Pepper, the hope is um, that um, coming out of tomorrow, you will have a couple of licks you can do. But again, I don't. The goal is to not think licks. Be able to play them, um, get them under your fingers, and you know there, there are some like I remember. There's one I still use that I learned that I love from that. Um, uh, West Montgomery did on a song and I just loved it and I still throw it in almost every jet time I play jazz. It was, uh, I forget what key it was in. It was like, it was something like that. It was, I just love that. Um, you know, he's playing the E minor seven and he's playing the, a, a minor seventh arpeggio, E minor backwards. So D, B, G, E. And then he goes to F natural, which is the, which is the sharp five of the ace, the five chord. And then he goes up to the, it's a very Charlie Parker thing. Playing six is very Charlie Parker in my head, but. And then he goes up to this, and then to the fifth of that. Anyway, you know, sometimes you learn, you hear a lick and you go, I gotta learn that lick. That's his, I love that lick. Story time. Okay, uh, story time, story time, story time. Let me think, let me think, let me think. Uh, you know, I have to pull out, I have to pull out uh, maybe a, a session story. Can I think of a session story? Oh, okay. Um, I, should, I need to do a video for my playlist. Um, that for um, people that want to be full-time musicians or full-time, really anything in the business, we, we, we need the poo. Um, so I'm going to talk about Marco Antonio Solis, a session I did. Oh, Paul, stop it. <laughs> God bless you, <laughs> Paul. Yeah, Paul, Paul. Paul got a windfall, right? <laughs> I owe him for making, I owe him for making me the best closet in the world. Man, that thing was rock solid. I swear to God, Paul, if that building ever comes down in an earthquake, that closet is still going to be there. <laughs> it's hilarious. Alex is Alex is using it. He's he's still got the apartment. He just sent me a video. He's got um, he did colored lights and everything in there. It's pretty cool. Okay, so what was I going to look up? I forget what I was going to look up now. I was getting ready. To... Um. So uh, the um. Oh, I, I oh no! Well, I was gonna I was gonna post that playlist. Yeah, let me post the playlist. Uh, playlist. Um, it was it's my playlist. That's uh, the business of making music, and and I literally had titles for. Um, uh, here it is. I had titles for I think seven, seventy videos, but these videos just don't. I mean, I could do a random sampling. Um. Here's the playlist. Oh, Art, thank you so much. God bless you. You guys are going above and beyond. Um, so like, for example, the first one, some, uh, getting the game is the second one. Being in the right place. In other words, if you're living in Des Moines um, or in Idaho, you know, you're probably not going to be able to, to be playing on major records or on TV shows or movies or something. It's unlikely. I might be able to. Because most of my work is done remotely now. All of my employers would probably hire me no matter where I lived at this point. Um, and that's something for us to think about. Um, but I think we, I like, I like our house. I, I, you know, I love being close to the kids. So 
Living below your means is a big thing. Uh, should I go to music school, be your own college? My five reasons to take a gig. Should I learn to read music? These are all titles of, and I put them in order, kind of a pseudo order. I try to record, uh, guard your brand, don't believe everything you hear. We talked about that one the other day. Uh, intro to mailbox money, types of film music, types of TV music, what are PROs, making wish lists, collaboration, what is sidelining, uh, the real book gig is part, was part of that. Um, in fact, I can post, uh, can, oh, they don't let me do this as, I just have to click on it and then mute it. It's Ak Perlman. My mom actually drove Ak. She worked, volunteered for the Indianapolis Symphony and she picked up It's Ak. She was his driver for the weekend he was at Indianapolis. She said he was very, very nice. Let's see. Um, Here's that playlist that I just mentioned, or that, that not sorry, the playlist. I sent the, I put the playlist there. Here's that video about the real book thing. I want to do one, though, about Google. <laughs> Google is your friend. And because uh, I, so I have a very dear friend of mine who just got back from Ecuador. He's from, he and his wife are from Ecuador. And they're, and they're the only, I've played on her records, and they're the only Ecuadorians who ever win a Grammy Award. Um, his wife and, um, uh, Pablo um, was pr literally probably one of my best friends, uh, if not my best friend. And um, but he he works with some pretty major artists, and he wouldn't always bring me in on those sessions, even though we're very good friends. It's like it's a lot of pressure on on a major on a producer. You got to have the best musicians you can afford, and so I get that. And the, but this I got he but he kind of did me a favor by bringing me in on this session. And what it was was a it was a it was a recording session for a medley for a TV show in Miami. So we were doing a medley of Marco Antonio Solis's songs, Marco Antonio, and um, not Mark Anthony, different artists. But he's like the top, one of the top three selling artists of all time in Mexico. Huge artist for those who know him. Um, and uh, so. Um, we were going to record a Conway. We were going to record something like a medley of, I think it was 11 songs, or maybe it was seven songs and the chart was 11 pages. I just remember it was a pretty big, uh, it was a pretty big chart. And I was brought in to play acoustic and were, everybody was brought in at different times. So the, the drummer was, it wasn't Bisson, uh, Greg Bissonette. It was, uh, oh shoot. I can't remember, but it was, t t t you know, top guys in town. And then there was me. <laughs> so I come in to do the acoustic stuff. And I, I get in there. I'm really nervous. I bring all my acoustics. There's actually two stories in one. I've told the other story part of this uh, another time. But I get in there. I'm, I'm really nervous. Um, I sit down on the sofa. We're at Conway, which is a really nice studio. I think it's on Santa Monica Boulevard in Hollywood. Um, really beautiful. It's a lot of rooms in there. I've done some work there with Justin. Uh, Maroon 5 records. There are a lot of everybody. You know, you can look at their website, Conway, C-O-N-W-A-Y, and you can see all the artists that have recorded there. I mean, I've seen Maroon 5 there and stuff. but um, And it's just really beautiful grounds, really very natural. The, the studio itself, the wood floors are just, they look like they're a thousand years old. They look like, the, the floor of the studio looks like it came from a, like a sunken pirate ship. I mean, it's just the most beautiful wood. It smells so good in there. The humidity is perfect. You get your guitar out. Everything just sounds really good in this room. And there's, you know, three or four different rooms at Conway, some small ones and some bigger ones. We were in the big one. And so I sit down there and I sit down on the sofa. I'm really nervous. Oh, Dennis has a question. Uh, where was it? Dennis, Dennis. I, I don't. Oh, it must have gotten away from me here. Hold on. Sorry, sorry. Dennis. Story time. No? Let's see. I missed it, Dennis. Where, I, where is it? Oh, I see. Mach machete. I don't know who Machete is. Or what... I know what a Machete is. <laughs> yeah, you'll have fun. You'll have fun, Don, going through all those. <laughs> and now that you know all the people I'm referring to... <laughs> <laughs> you'll know it's like it's a little weird watching these later and I'm like looking you know 
looking at the chat, but uh, I'm not sure what you're referencing on the machete thing. But uh, so I um, I sit down on the sofa and I turn to the guy next to me and there's a guy with a beard and he's sitting there and I'm like, hi, I'm Tom. What's your name? And he goes, Marco Antonio. And I went, oh, crap. You know, I probably should have Googled who you were before I got here so I could at least see pictures and know and recognize you, you know, it's just like so. You know, that was kind of my takeaway from that. It's like, okay, from now on, Google the artist so you know who you're, who you're working with. And, um, and then the next thing that happened was I get in the booth. I get in the control, or not in the booth, uh, the, in the room. And the engineer, is set, who will remain nameless, is setting up mics. And this, so this, this medley we were recording was supposed to be for a, a show he was doing in, uh, in Miami, a TV show. And it was going to be, you know, they were going to play this music and he was going to sing along with it or something. So um, I think they had a band there, but this was something different. I don't know why, but anyway. And the, this ended up on a record, which is interesting because I get money from records like this, but I never got any money from this record. But anyway, um, probably need to look into that. Um, but so I sit down and the, I start playing a guitar on the first song and the engineer says, that guitar is too bright. You have a darker guitar? And I'm like, sure. Yeah, I brought three acoustics, so I grab another guitar. And, and he goes, yeah, that one's, no, I don't, that's too bright. You have a dark guitar, a guitar that's voice darker. And I went, um, and I knew my third guitar was only brighter than the other two. So I picked it up, I played it. And he was like, yeah, that's brighter than the other two. And I'm like, yeah, sorry. Probably my darkest one's the Gibson. Um, and so uh, he made me feel like this big. And, uh, Pablo was I, I, Pablo was pretty aware of that. I think Pablo, Pablo later apologized for that. And it, it was kind of one of those things where I was kind of the unknown. Like he didn't do that to the other guys because the other guys were big session guys. But because I was a nobody, he, he kind of wanted to put me in pl my place. We have since worked together. And since that session, I've had much better like credits. And I think that guy has respected me. Um, uh, but... I ended up getting um, this guitar. So I went, because I always knew that Martin's had a darker tone. And so I ended up getting this guitar because of that session. I mean, seriously, like, I took the money I made from that session and went shopping. I don't think I made enough to buy that, but I made enough that it was like, okay, I gotta get it. I gotta get a Martin. So I went crazy trying to find Martins, and I found that Martin, and that became my favorite guitar. So it was kind of a good thing. Um, David. Uh, oh, birthday tomorrow. All right. <laughs> yeah. Happy birthday, David. Mm. So, um, let's see. Yeah, again, thanks for the super chats. That's really cool of you guys, Art and, and Paul. Um, but it's funny because I... I Okay, I'm going to tell a lie right now, or I'm going to tell you about a lie I told. <laughs> and it, it, it was it was a lie, but it was rooted in truth. So I get called to do another Marco Antonio Solis record. Three days at uh, East West, which is another really nice studio. In fact, I just picked up Frank Ocean's Orange record, which was is a great record. And I'd just gotten into that, and I was telling... <laughs> I was talking to the second engineer who was a young kid and I said, Hey, have you heard the new Frank Ocean record? <laughs> you know, have you heard this? It's a really cool record. I'm trying to be this old guy trying to be hip and everything. And this kid goes, Oh yeah, Frank recorded that here. I was second engineer on that record in this very room. And I'm like, Oh gee, just made a complete fool of myself, which is pretty much every day. So, um, but, but I, since, since that, session I'd probably picked up three more acoustics so I had a bunch of acoustics like this session I was just playing acoustic and nylon and uh, there was another guy that was playing uh, nylon later who was a really good nylon player plays on a million records uh, Spanish records um, he was coming in later to do stuff he was out of the out of town but I ended up playing acoustic uh, on a lot of tracks and um so when the engineer was coming in to get sounds on it, it was the same engineer and I said hey I named this guitar after you. And he said, what? And I said, well, that session I did years ago with you, you said none of my guitars were dark enough. And he goes, I did. He didn't remember doing this at all. And I said, yeah. I, and I, you know, he, 
he kind of got me a fire lit under me and I bought this guitar. Now, I didn't literally name it after him, but in some ways he is the re reason I bought the guitar. Well, at that point we had, <laughs> we had a little spark, a little moment, a little love connection there. And I also had like, like I said, three more guitars. I had like, I think I had eight or nine acoustic guitars to pick from for every song. Um, as well as like lap steel and stuff like that, you know, um, and, uh, wow, 50 years. Oh my gosh. You know, you, you should write a book, Bob. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so I, so we had, so it's funny because the new guy was my friend was, was Walter actually, Walter, you're not watching, are you? You remember this session? He started picking on Walter because I guess I would, I had, like we had enough of a history that he wasn't going to pick on me this time, so he ended up picking up on picking on Walter and doing the exact same thing to Walter he did to me. But we won't name names. But anyway, uh, it, it was it was one of those. It was just it's, it was crazy. But um, that was crazy. I remember actually Alex picking up picking me up at the airport and he or picking me up at the session because I had to go catch a flight. Um, and so he picked he took all my guitars and he took me to the airport and then he took all my guitars home. Uh, so that was, uh, that was awesome. So what are we looking at? Oh yeah, we're about an hour and a half. Yeah, I, you know, and the, and the, the, I always thought that the, my Gibson was a darker guitar. It was my first one, but when I listen to the Gibson versus the Martin, it's definitely the Martin. Martin's, here's the thing. Like I, I, when I first got my first acoustic, I couldn't really hear, um, uh, uh, I couldn't really hear much difference between a Gibson or a Martin, which are the two main guitars you would hear on a record. And Taylors are in there too now, more recently. And um, but I got to the point once I owned a Taylor, I mean, and a Gibson and a Martin, that I could start to hear the difference between them. And you can have a bright Martin, and you can have a dark Gibson. You could have a Martin that's far brighter than a Gibson, and so on and so forth. A lot of times, if the strings are brand new, they're going to be brighter, and if the strings are really old, any guitar is going to sound darker. And I do, that's one of the reasons I like uh, Elixir Strings uh, endorsement here, um, because uh, they do kind of go on a little darker. They do have a little warmer tone out of the box. Um, they have a kind of more of a worn in tone and they stay that way for a long time. And that's, that's kind of why I like them. Uh, I almost prefer brand new, like, uh, you know, burnt Ernie Balls because they're bright, but they don't stay that way for very long because my hands, I have such acidic sweat. Um, but I, uh, can now tell more, you know, I can tell a Gibson and a, a Taylor, like on a record. And oftentimes if it, if I hear a record, like, oh, it could be an old record, could be a, a brand new record or something. Somebody's playing me. I go, oh, that sounds like a Gibson. I mean, it's hard to sometimes tell the difference between like a Loudon and a, a Collins or something like that. That's a little tougher. Um, like James Taylor plays Olson's. And, uh, you know, I, I couldn't really, it just sounds like James Taylor. You could pick up any guitar. It's going to sound like him. Um, he could, he could pick up any guitar, but, um, I'll hear, I'll hear Gibson on a record. I go, Oh, that's a Gibson. And I'll hear, Oh, that's a Taylor. And then if it just sounds like a guitar to me on a record, to me, that's just like, Oh, that's a Martin. <laughs> if it doesn't sound like a Gibson or a Taylor, I'd probably assume it's a Martin because Martin, Martins just have such a history and they've been on every acoustic record forever. You know, on any record that has an acoustic on it, you just are so used to hearing it, whether it's, you know, Bob Dylan or whether it's, you know, uh, Johnny Cash or you go back to the bluegrass, you know, gods of yore. So, um, yeah, so Elixir Strings, uh, Hook, you might, let me know what you think of them. You know, originally I've been with them for a long time. Uh, back when I first started leading worship, I was using them and breaking a lot of the G strings would break a lot. And so they actually had me package, you know, five or six G strings that broke together and send it to them so they could, um, uh, so they could analyze and see what happened and what went wrong. And eventually the G string stopped breaking. So they, whatever they did, they, whatever they changed helped that problem. Um, the other thing they did was they, cause I was teaching clinics, they, they printed up these cards and, um, I could hand them out for a free set. I would get like a stack of 200 or whatever, or a thousand of them. And I would go to clinics and I'd have like Anywhere from when I first started doing the clinics for Maranatha, it was like 20 people in a room. But at the end, I was like, there were 200 guitar players in a room. It was crazy. It was insane to be teaching, you know, that many people at once. But um, 
I would give out the cards, you know, I would, I would, everybody got a card. It was really pretty cool. And uh, everybody got a free set of elixirs. And I said, oh, you guys, uh, it's really cool that you do that for all your clinicians and all your, everybody. Because my name was on the card. So I just assumed they printed up a bunch of others, you know, they would say courtesy of Joe Blow or whatever, courtesy of mine said, courtesy of Tom Straley. And um, they said, no, you're the only one we've ever done that for. <laughs> so I was like, oh, really? That's cool. I didn't know that. So, um <laughs> Your newest guitar will be legal next year. So you're, you've got a 17-year-old guitar. <laughs> That's funny, Gary. Uh, uh, so, how do you, uh, so how do you pick a guitar? Sorry. Just playing it, just listening to it. Um, uh, I, you know, one of the tips, in fact, I have a video out that was I did a while ago, but I did it since I've lived in the house. So let me see if I can find it. Um, it's uh, buying an acoustic guitar, uh, you know, tips for buying an acoustic guitar. I don't know that it gets a lot of... A lot of spins I haven't noticed. Let me see. Um, improvisation, string, reading. Let's get started. Tim, day in life. Okay, next page. So these are fairly strumming. Ten tips to increase your speed. Yeah, it was before that. I guess I've done more videos than I thought I've done. I've not done any work on my record project. That's just not going to happen. It's just. Oh, here it is. Tips for buying your first acoustic. I think I can get a shareable link here. Um, so one of the tips I give, which is a really good tip, it really uh, is bring someone that plays guitar with you to the store. Um, the string gauge I use on my acoustics are the top string is is a twelve, so they're lights. Extra light would be ten. Why does it seem so dark in here? Does it seem dark in here? Eh. Um, Let's see, David, question, uh, question, which elixir strings for acoustic and which for electric again? I forgot. Um, I, I sometimes will get the polyweb uh, lights for acoustic. As far as the 80-20 thing, that's up to you if you like kind of a bronze wound. Uh, but you could do the 80-20 poly, but the poly is going to have more coating on it. It's going to be a little denser. The nano web is more invisible, and I think they have another one. Uh, that they have out, um, I, I don't keep up on I need to give them, next time I'm at NAM, I probably need to have them give me like one of everything, but it's just such a pain to change strings and then play it and go, oh yeah, this is different than this. And if you don't do it on the same guitar, you don't really get a fair, um, a fair shake on, you know, the string doesn't get a fair test. Um, and then on the electrics, I definitely use the NanoWeb 9s. Oh no, I'm sorry, 10s. So the light also. So the 12s are the high, when you say 12s, that means the high, the skinniest string is a 12, 0 0.012 inches. Um, let's see, there, David question. Yeah, I see the David question. Oh, no. Oh, and then, yeah, so as far as picking up a question, guitar, what you can do if you have an acoustic already um, and you want to get a second acoustic, one of the things you don't want to do is you don't want to buy an acoustic. I never understand why people own seven Les Pauls. Uh, why would you own seven HD 28 Martins? It doesn't make any sense. I, I don't understand why people do that. That's more uncommon. I see people owning like seven Les Pauls. Strats, you know, you can have a couple Strats. I have a couple Strats, hardtail and a, and a you know, uh, one with a whammy bar. Um, or you could have different pickup configurations or whatever, and that makes sense. Um, but as far as acoustics go, you can bring one of your acoustics with you to the store and then have, bring a friend with you too and have, you know, take turns playing them. And so you can hear it from in front of the guitar and you can really see, because you want to make sure you buy a guitar that sounds different than, than your current guitar. When I bought my Loudon, um, I bought it and I didn't have my Gibson with me. But as soon as I picked it up, I went, wow, this sounds completely different than my Gibson, which I had had since, let's see, I got, one, I got that one in 91, I think. I was 30. And I got the Loudon in 97 because I was going to do clinics for Maranatha. And then within a week, I was I got a Taylor that Bob Taylor sent me. Um, so, uh, I yes, the big the heavier the strings, the, the the darker the tone. So if you went to a thirteen on an acoustic, um, it's definitely going to be a, a kind of a fuller or darker tone. If you go with lights like extra light acoustic strings, the same thing's true with electric. Um, you would find that you're going to get a uh, brighter tone or a thinner tone and it's all in the ear of the beholder um, it was interesting because uh, 
Rick Beato did a whole thing on using eights. And I think somebody said that uh, the guitar player for ZZ Top, uh, Billy Gibbons, uses sevens. I didn't even know they made sevens. There were so many people watching that video on him using eights and saying how eights had really the best tone. I would say the eights have a, a really good like bottom end tone to them in some ways because uh, the strings have to be t pretty loose to get that low tone. Um, and so, uh, so that was definitely, um, that definitely, it's weird. It's kind of the opposite of what everybody was told. I mean, I went from nines to tens because I thought, oh, it's a better tone. Stevie Ray Vaughan used 12s, I think even 13s. They talk about it in that video with Rick Beato. Uh, but he also tuned down a half step. So the strings weren't, if you were to play 13s with a standard tuning, um, you would, it would be really hard to bend. But if you lower everything down a half step, and you can also adjust um, your uh, bridge or your whammy bar. In fact, Carl Verheyen has a great video out somewhere. You can probably find where he, he gets really into adjusting the, the screws and the plates and everything behind the guitar in here, adjusting the, how the thing is mounted to create the right tension so that you can get the strings to actually go down in a more uniform man. It's like crazy, you know, like almost like nanotechnology with a guitar. Um, I haven't really applied that because I don't really do a lot of whammy stuff, but um, it's, it's interesting stuff. Um, so anyway, let's see. Uh, hopefully that kind of answers your question. Um, but I really do recommend taking a guitar um, or taking a friend to see uh, to, to try out guitars and bring, bring the, you, if you have an acoustic, bring an acoustic. The other thing is if you have a really cheap acoustic, say you've got like a cheap Fender or cheap something um, acoustic, I'm not picking up Fender, but say you have a baby Taylor or a, a, you know, whatever cheap Taylor, you know, it's still not cheap, but um, when you listen to say the low, the, the bottom line Martin versus a really nice Martin, you'll start to hear the difference between those. When you get your first acoustic guitar, you're like, hey, it sounds like an acoustic guitar. And you don't really realize how boxy it sounds and toy-like it sounds until you play it against a, a much better instrument. But you don't need to spend, I mean, I literally spent $1,100 on this. It was used from the 70s, which isn't the best era for Martins. Um, and it was abused. And um, I took it to my guy and he fixed it up and really got a, um, um, uh, really got it, got it up to speed. I got to take it back in. It's got the issues again, but it's worth it because I, I really love the tone of that guitar. Um, let's see, uh, David. You said a wish. I uh, a wish a wish list for you is a Martin acoustic, Taylor twelve string acoustic, Ibanez semi holly body for jazz. You know, David. Also check out. Uh, I've never owned one, but I played them. The Yamaha has a like a a, a hollow body jazz box that also has a um, tr uh, piezo pickup in it, like for acoustic, and you can blend the two. Now, I don't know if they still have that guitar. I think it's an AXEX or something like that. Um, and uh, that thing, I played one of those one time, and you know, it kind of, when you blend those two, the, like the neck pickup and the piezo pickup, when you kind of blend them together and you find that sweet spot, it really got that West Montgomery sound that's, you know, that's, that, that 60s, 70s jazz guitar, 50s, 60s, 70s jazz guitar sound that's really, really hard to get, um, especially in a DAW. I did a, a session for a Lifetime movie a couple days ago where I was playing on a, a, a jazz version of Deck the Halls. And, man, I, I had to, I used my Ibanez, uh, I used my, not my Ibanez, I used my, the, that Gibson 175, uh, the one that led me to the Lord. Remember that? I told that story. Um, and that one... Um, uh, it took me a long time to kind of get a sound. I went, yeah, that sounds close. It still doesn't sound right. But it's good enough for under dialogue on a TV show. Because I'm not miking amps. But even miking and amps, you know, it's just hard to find that sound. So check out. Um, I'll see if I can find it. Um, and uh, I need to get a Gretsch too, David. That's on my list as well. Uh, and a, do you want, I know you want a Dan Electro. Dan Electro, you can get a lot cheaper than the Telecaster. Uh, but the Telecaster it comes with a lipstick pickup in the neck position and then more of a, a, a single, co single coil, like bright. Uh, it's usually wound, they're wound pretty, uh, pretty loud. Uh, you'll notice a big difference between the neck pickup and the bridge pickup on a Tele, like volume wise and noise wise too. The neck pickup's always noisier on a Tele. Um, 
Yeah, the Gibson, I, I my Gibson Dove, I got super lucky on, Bob. Um, I just, I had never played, owned a guitar, acoustic guitar. But uh, like I said, the reason I bought the acoustic was because Beth and I were leading worship for our Sunday school class. And we had, a, it was a big church and our Sunday school class was 50 couples. And they didn't have a PA system or anything like that. So that's 100 people in a big room. So I needed an acoustic guitar that was going to be really, really loud. And uh, and that's all I was looking for. <laughs> I was like, and so I played a lot of guitars. And, and Scott, who's my friend, is going to help me with, there's a fly in here. Scott, who's my friend, is going to help me with my um, my uh, uh, computer issue, hopefully. Um, he uh, He's the one that sold me that Gibson. And uh, I mean, I got it for $1,000. It was brand new, but the guy, it was used. The guy returned it, didn't like it or whatever. I don't know who it was. He has the initials RS. I was thinking maybe Rick Springfield or I don't know. His his initials are still on the case. <laughs> so, um, but I, um, um, so I've had, I got that guitar and I'm really happy with it. It's, it's, it's just been a great workhorse of a guitar. And uh, once I, I, I don't, I think the pickup works in, no, the pickup doesn't work in. There's some pictures of me playing with Justin Bieber where I've got my foot on, on my foot, my, sh my shoe off and I got my, my foot foot on the cord coming from into the going into the di so i'm like i'm grounding my guitar because it's buzzing and they're taking the direct they're taking the direct they're making it too they're probably not using the direct but they wanted to have that option but they're like it's buzzing and i went oh shoot and for some reason i thought oh well maybe if i put my foot on the cord it'll stop buzzing because oh i touched it with my hand it stopped buzzing but i couldn't hold it in the hand and strum so i literally uh uh there we go peter um i literally um <laughs> took my shoe off and put my foot on. I'll post a picture. Uh, I'll, put, I'll post a picture uh, of that in a second here. Um, oh, dang. Yeah, that's a great gift. The HD28. I need. I would love to get an HD28. I wouldn't mind getting a boutique acoustic as well. I should pull out. I've got a... a, 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 a see, what, do I, what is it? A D28. No, what is it? A 20, uh, my, my, I have a 1924 Martin 0-28. Is it an 0-28? Um, I've played it on a few videos, but I can have it. I could bring it out sometime. It's gorgeous, but it's very fragile. It's been crushed and repaired uh, before. Rudy Sarzo, yeah, could have been Rudy Sarzo. Is he in L.A.? Uh, no, I know Rudy, actually. Rudy's a bass player, though. Touch, I touch my face, so everybody take a drink. I spent a day walking around NAMM show with Rudy Sarzo. He told me a crazy story. I'll tell you a Rudy Sarzo story. Um, but, uh, Rudy, um, yeah, it was impossible to get around Nam with Rudy because he, um, <laughs> every 15 feet, somebody was talking to talk to him for 15 minutes. So you're just standing there, listening to someone talk to Rudy. And then you walk another 15 feet and, and the Nam shows this giant music convention for all the gear that's coming out. Um, yeah, Rudy was a bass player. Yeah. I'm sure he has guitars, but he has a lot of basses. But Rudy told me this story. I mean, you all know, but I, you may not know, but, but Ozzy Osbourne's guitar player uh, that died in the plane crash. What was his name? Uh, oh, shoot. Somebody's going to know it really, you know. Uh, but what that he told me what happened that day, and it was crazy. So what happened was the bus driver, who was crazy, um, he, he really wanted them to come down to his place in Florida because he... His parents or father or something had an airplane and they had a landing strip at their house at their farm in Florida. Randy Rhodes, right. And so it's funny because they had a bus and so he drove the bus. He drove them down there and Ozzy and Rudy, who was the drummer? Uh, Nikki Sticks, was it Nikki Sticks? Was the drummer? Um, and then Randy and then, of course, they're, you know, like their stage manager, or road manager or whatever. And their hairstylist, because <laughs> it was the 80s. And they were a hair metal band. And so they brought their own hairstylist with them everywhere they went. And so, <clears throat> so basically Rudy and everybody was sleeping still in the bus, but they got to the guy's house, got to the guy's farm. And apparently his pilot's license had expired. And um, Rudy said that the, the, everybody on the bus got woken up because something hit the bus and woke them up. And then they woke up and then they heard this crash, this big crash. Um, and Rudy is pretty sure that the bus driver 
intentionally crashed the plane, and he was trying to crash it into the bus, but he missed. So all that hit the bus were, were the wheel. He wanted to kill everybody. Because I guess he was crazy and broken up with his girlfriend or something like that. And the girl that was their hairstylist was also on the plane with Randy. I, don't, I can't remember who else was on the plane. Um, uh, oh, Vinny. Was it Vin, Oh, t uh, Tom. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, uh, drummer Nikki Sticks, I think, is a drummer for... He was a heavy metal drummer in the 80s. Well, still is. Um, but yeah, so that, I think, but Rudy doesn't know for a fact because they, all they know is the plane crash, but I'm pretty sure he said that I think there were skid marks on the roof of the bus. Like he tried to hit the bus and maybe, maybe even Randy kind of intervened and said, pulled up on the stick or something. I don't know to try to save their lives. But, uh, but clearly the guy was, uh, you know, oh, I'm going to buzz the bus or something. I don't know, but they all died. Maybe it was, maybe it was not intentional, but Rudy seems to think it was <laughs> so. Anyway, on that note, <laughs> it's crazy. That's a note right there. Okay, okay. Yeah, Carmen Apice is a drummer. I know that, but um, I don't know who was the drummer on that. It's probably on the Wikipedia page about the about Randy Rhodes. But I think Randy Rhodes, Randy, Randy was the only musician killed on that on that crash. But dang, that was crazy. So yeah, who knows? Yeah, uh, David David said supposedly Randy was taking pictures from the plane. I, yeah, I don't know. That it'd be interesting to see, but that was literally from Rudy's mouth that he told this story, and I was like, "That's crazy," because I hadn't heard that before. I just heard that the plane crashed and that they died. I didn't. Rudy thinks he again. Rudy was asleep, but he thinks that the guy was trying to kill them all. So if he'd been, you know, it would have been a totally different story if the plane crashed into the into the bus. So anyway. Uh, thanks everybody for hanging out. I'm going to end the stream now and I'll see you tomorrow. Today was less than what? 47. Oh my gosh. So we're almost to 50. That's crazy. Everybody take a drink. Cheers. Thanks for playing along at home and I'll see you tomorrow. We're going to, we're going to do a little bit more riff lick fill edge there for you, Pepper. So you're going to be, we're going to do some, we're going to have some fun with this blue scale. <laughs> with, uh, where is it? It's over here. That the blue scale right here. We're gonna have more fun with. Hey, we're gonna more with just the top two strings. Okay. Take care, everybody. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, nice to see you, Phil.